Hi, everybody. Thank you for your patience. My name is Robert Barker. I'm the Associate Director of the Poetry Center. I'd like to welcome you to today's reading. Um, before I get started, I'll just remind everyone, just as a matter of course, next week's reading, Opal Palmer, Adisa, and Jeff Tagami will be here in the Poetry Center, 4.30, same time, same place. Um, Today's uh, a special day for us here. We have a very distinguished group of Japanese-American writers and activists who are going to share their experience with us. And it's going to be a bit of a different format um, from usual. And we're lucky today to have Janice Mirakatani. Um, Janice is the author of We the Dangerous, New and Selected Poems, and has been published in numerous anthologies, journals, and scholarly publications in Japan, Japan America, and Great Britain. So, uh, with post haste, I will introduce you right now to Janice and give her the floor. Please welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. It truly is an honor for me to introduce and participate with three Nisei women who are role models, who are sheroes. When I met with these three women last month, whom I've long admired through the years, I thought to myself, my God, this is the generation of my mother. No wonder we have survived and thrived and learned how to fight. So if you don't mind, I'd like to read a poem to my mother in honor of the three of you. Mother, you worked hard mending lives, mending wounds from rejections and divorce. You told me, my Nisei mother, that pretty was not enough. I watched as you saved everything, paper sacks, aluminum foil, string rolled into an infinite ball. You told me hard work was not enough. You reveal your ends of string, your suppressed rage, reluctantly for redress. You break the silence, break the fence of barbed wire that locked us in an Arkansas concentration camp. Being citizen was not enough, you say. But mother, your hands are strong. You weave the fibers of rebellion in my bones. You give your light and silences vanish. You untie the knots of hurt and anger. And I cut, connect, bind, repair. Oh, look, mother, at these hands shaped like yours. Look at this woman rising up from balls of string. I unravel threads of unworth. I uncover your love, your love, your love. I am the stubborn root of you, beautiful enough in all my contradictions. Oh, look, mother, how powerful is this mending. Well, the love of these three women make for powerful mending, a legacy of redress. They brought us through the most dark and difficult times of history and brought us to a greater place of light, correcting injustices. Because of these three women, it is no wonder that many Sansei and Yonsei become involved in the movements of today, in the movement for redress. It is no wonder that there has been a climate created in our time for conscience and compassion a ferocity to create community. No wonder these are generations who are and will be more dedicated to justice, to diversity, and who affirm and celebrate our diversity, our identity. These three women collectively and individually have created the footprints, the imprints of a movement that the unjust incarceration of a people, no matter what race, what class, what sexual orientation, gender, or nationality will never happen again. I'm going to start with the introduction of Chizu Yama, and I will introduce all three all together, and then each will come up and make a presentation, and then we'll open it up for discussion and questions. 
Chizu Iyama has been an activist all her life and continues this activism in many causes and organizations for peace and justice. When she was just out of the University of California at Berkeley, Chizu was initiated into her field of social work while imprisoned at Topaz camp during World War II, counseling her fellow internees. Her work when she was liberated continued as the head of early childhood education at Contra Costa College. She was one of the organizers and board members of West Contra Costa Children's Council and Early Childhood Mental Health Program. Chizu has been a leader in the Japanese American community on women's concerns in the JACL and the National Japanese American Historical Society where she developed exhibits and chaired the exhibit of Strength and Diversity, History of Japanese American Women, which opened at the Oakland Museum and then toured the United States under the auspices of the Smithsonian. Chizu is known for her fiery voice, her unwavering commitment. She has been active in the campaign for redress with the National Coalition for Redress and Reparations, testifying before a Senate committee. Her passion makes her widely known and uh, makes her a widely known and popular lecturer on the subject of internment. Noriko Bridges Flynn, Nikki as we fondly call her. Nikki, Nikki's father came to the United States in 1901, and her mother came as a picture bride in 1918. They farmed leased land in California, which they were forbidden by law to own. Nikki grew up in Garden Grove, California, and after one year of junior college, was, in her words, in quote, a guest of the United States government for three years in Arizona. She returned to San Francisco and joined an office workers' union, Nikki has for years been involved in the labor movement and in anti-war organizations. She served as chair in the vanguard of organizations protesting the United States' involvement in the Vietnam War, the Jeanette Rankin Brigade. Nikki is a powerful activist and writer. She is outspoken and courageous. She has always been a mirror to me and to others of her generation as well as my generation. Her daughter, Catherine, is now one of two women foresters employed by the state of Oregon. May Nakano was born in Colorado, daughter of a Japanese tenant farmer family. She came to California during the Depression, but returned to Colorado once more to spend three years in an American wartime camp during World War II. After raising three children, she started college at the age of 46 and graduated summa cum laude at the California State University at Hayward and has since earned a master's degree in language and literature. She gave up her teaching career in community colleges to write more and to partner a small press. She is author of Japanese American Women, Three, Generation, Three Generations, and a children's book, Rico Rabbit. She was also a journalist for the Pacific Citizen, the only national Japanese-American newspaper in the United States. In 1995, May received the Civil Rights Leadership Award from the California Association of Human Rights Organizations. As a writer, activist, May is like a steady stream. She nourishes and quenches as we sip from her wisdom and achievements. She is presently writing a novel which draws on her experiences in camp. It is my great honor and pleasure to introduce these three incredible women. Chizu Iwama, would you come up, please? Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to talk to you. I'm a little embarrassed at the very lavish praise that she put upon us, and all, but you know, we're good friends, <laughs> and all, but I'd like to. Uh, talk. I'm not a poet, and I write only articles, and I write uh, things like teacher's guides and things of that kind, so that when they asked me to speak, I said, well, why me? Because um, I'm not a, uh, a, a writer per se, and she told me at that time that I really need to talk a little bit, a little background, something about the camps and something about my life. And because my life is so long, I mean, I'm 76 years old, it would, you know, it takes forever to get through it. So uh, I'm going to just kind of pick out some different spots. Um, I'd like to point out that, first of all, the defining moment for Japanese Americans of my generation is World War II. I'm sure World War II affected people all over the world and in the United States. But for us, it had a very special meaning because our government 
put us into concentration camps. And that was very, very special and hopefully will never happen again. But I, uh, I did go to uh, Topaz, um, which is a place that I stayed in uh, in the desert in Utah, one of the, the camps, the permanent camp. And we had an opportunity to go back to Topaz about four years ago. And um, we went there, and I stood on the place where my barracks was, 343D. And as I stood there with the hot sun streaming on my neck, with the um, breezes whipping up the dust all over our hair and our face, with the uh, sagebrush all over, seeing these um, beautiful mountains in the distance, it brought back so many memories and tears, which I really rarely shared about the, exa about the period of World War II in terms of our own personal experiences. It was a sad moment for me to realize that my parents and my sisters and their families were here in this godforsaken desert for three and a half years. And I was fortunate in that I left after a year so that I could go on to school. I went on to a school leave so that, um, you know, the realization of what it must have been for the people really hit me again that day. What was missing were the voices that we would hear in the morning as uh, the Issei neighbor next door would get up and bang the door and they would start talking in Japanese. Uh, the missing were the voices of happy children as they were running off going to the uh, mess hall to have breakfast, the clatter of the dishes that we would hear in the morning, and some of the songs that people would be singing. And that was when I thought what really made the experience endurable were the people that were in the camps and how they helped each other. But let me tell you my story. My father came in 1906. My mother came uh, from Japan in 1911. My mother was also a picture bride, um, uh, which uh, flourished between about 1910 to 1920. Um, they were working very hard and it was very difficult because my parents could not become citizens because of immigration laws, discriminatory immigration laws. Um, my father could not own land after 1913 because of um, uh, legislation that was passed. Um, they could not find jobs, uh, could not find uh, housing and all, so they, they were more or less segregated into different communities. And uh, most of the people who came were young men at the beginning and they were uh, working in agriculture and all. And in San Francisco, my parents went, came and stayed in San Francisco. It was hard work and I did want to read one of the um, poems that, anonymous poems written by a woman uh, at this time. And she says, America, um, once a dream of hope and longing, now a life of tears. Hope for my children helps me endure much from it, this alien land. And I think that she brought in the whole idea that our parents had. They were powerless. They were not citizens. They could not vote. They had no power. So all their hopes were really centered on the children. And this is the kind of thing that we grew up with, knowing that our parents loved us and wanted for us a much better life than they would have. Um, we, we, um, went to school. Nisei went to school in um, San Francisco, or I went in San Francisco, and at that time we learned a lot as I went through um, elementary school, junior and uh, junior high and, and high school, learned a lot about democracy and freedom. And together with that, we learned the kind of values that our parents pushed as being very strong in terms of responsibility, caring for one another, helping one another, etc. And also for the uh, uh, idea of um, really uh, the importance of family. And that's been very strong. And even today, you will find that with all of our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Um, there was maybe I should explain some terms. When I say Issei, they were the immigrants and they came between 1885 and, and 1924 when all immigration was stopped from Japan, again because of what we call discriminatory laws. Um, 
the women who came um, came from about 1910, although there were some who came a little earlier. But therefore, at the time of World War II, the Issei men were in their middle 50s. And the Issei women were about 10 years to 15 years younger, and the Nisei were 18 years old. That was the median age of the uh, people who were put into the camps. But let me get on with Pearl Harbor. And when Pearl Harbor happened, I was going to the University of California. I was a senior. I was tw uh, just turned 20. And at the time, we were we all gathered together at the library, all of us who were Japanese Americans, and and shared our anxiety about what would happen to us in the future. And um, we knew that there was discrimination personally. Uh, I know, for example, that uh, my sisters could not find jobs outside of the Japanese businesses. I knew that my father and mother could not become citizens. And also in uh, some of the public uh, accommodation places, we were not welcome, including places like uh, Sutro Baths over here in San Francisco. Um, and at that time, um, we also um, were very concerned about our parents, what was going to happen to our parents. Um, well, we were told at that time that the university called us together, and we went to a meeting of university people, and the administration urged us to stay into school because so many of the people were leaving. They told us, finish your your finals, December 7th, you know, and finals was still going on. And they told us, uh, get through with your finals and come on back to the university because your education is going to be very important to you. And they were right. It was very important to us. But um, they ended up by saying, um, well, remember that you are American citizens and you do have rights. Well, two and a half months later, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, and that started in motion the events that led to the in eventual incarceration of 110,000 people from the West Coast, eventually 120,000 Japanese Americans in camps. And um, uh, we were given uh, five days in April, this is February, and all through March we didn't know what was really going to happen, all little steps taken so that, for example, we had curfew, we couldn't go five miles beyond our house, etc. And every day, because I was commuting to Berkeley, I knew I was breaking the law, but, you know, these things happen. Um, in April, um, on my sister's birthday, we left um, San Francisco. Now. Um, my sister was the head of the household. My older sister, who was 24, became head of the household. In the uh, historical research that we've been doing, we found young girls, 14 years old, being heads of households because their fathers had been taken away. Uh, fathers uh, taken away because the FBI had fingered them as possible um, subversive. And what happened, of course, was that um, people who were uh, teachers of Japanese language, people who were teaching the martial arts, uh, Japanese, American com uh, Japanese American community leaders, um, and all, they were the ones who were picked up, and my father was one of those picked up, and they were sent to a separate camp. Um, well, the, there was, we had to do a lot of work. For example, five days, what would you do? Five days in which to leave, and we had, my father had a hotel, and my father had a, an apartment house in the name of my, my sister. And, you know, what would you do with, uh, with, uh, with your property? What do you do with your household goods? What would you do with your cars? You know, there were just a lot of, of problems that we faced trying to make do with five days and then also preparing. Um, we, um, the underlying question that we had was, where were we going? What was going to happen to us? How long are we going to stay? What kind of conditions are we going to face? And we were told we could only take what we could carry. So my mother went out. We were very poor. My mother went out to the 5 and 10 and got paper uh, suitcases for all of us. We were so proud. We'd never had a suitcase in our life. And all. But we put all these things then and all. In my case, because I was go going to school and I was graduating from Cal um, uh, in the spring semester, I thought I would bring some of my books because I was so optimistic that I would have a chance to go on to school. My brother, who was a jazz fan, 
you know, brought, insisted on bringing his trombone. My mother was very angry at him because one hand was so busy carrying that trombone and the rest of it, we all had to share what, you know, his clothes and everything else in our, you know, suitcases. And, um, and we had to bring also sheets and, and uh, pillowcases and, you know, whatever, whatever we could um, stuff in our um, suitcases. Think of the parent who has, we, we went across, came across so many parents who had three or four little kids and trying to get all their stuff into two suitcases and uh, having to carry a child. I mean, it was just incredibly impossible for us. Um, the, so we came to San Francisco over into one of two, we got on a train. And, you know, I can't remember too well all the things that happened because it was so long ago. But we did uh, end up in a place called Santa Anita, and that's in the racetracks right uh, out, um, um, outside of Los Angeles. I guess it's in Pasadena. And the conditions in camp for the first month was really a nightmare because the Army was not ready for us. And um, it was really um, terrible food that made us sick. We had uh, uh, bathroom facilities and uh, shower facilities that robbed us of our dignity with no privacy at all, no doors, nothing in between. Um, we were um, subjected to such uh, uh, really scary things with the soldiers running around with their guns pointed at us. In, they were on the watchtowers, but they were their um, guns were pointed toward us. And so that was the worst thing. We felt we knew we were in jail. Um, it's a credit to the Japanese Americans that they did the best they could under the circumstances. There was an underlying feeling, especially among the Nisei, young, you know, young people. If you're talking about 18 years old, 17, 18, you know, one of the big tasks is knowing who you are. And it was, who am I? Am I American? Am I Japanese? Does the American citizenship mean anything to me? And there was just a lot of, of uh, anxiety about who they were. But, you know, the um, camps came, and because I was a uh, graduate, let me add, uh, I received my diploma in, uh, uh, in my uh, horse stall uh, in camp. We were put into horse stalls, and uh, our family, although there were barracks for us or some of the people, and it was a bad situation, uh, but to me the most poignant memory I have of Santa Anita is walking down as uh, chair of the, um, I was really um, co-chair of the Department of Recreation and for a short time of education. But that memory I have of children's voices singing God Bless America every morning, and it was so ironic because, you know, it was our government that put us in there. Well, um, we had in the camps, the camps were not all grim in the sense that the people in the camps put together programs so that, you know, I was 20 years old, what would I know about how to organize a camp of 18,000 people, recreation for them, and, and all. But everybody pitched in and everybody helped, and I think this made the difference. So we replicated what we knew on the outside. So we had like a scouting program, can you imagine in camp? We had boys clubs, girls clubs, arts and crafts, we had uh, baseball teams um, uh, and, and all, so that we started to develop some things. Now this was our temporary camp. It was called an assembly center, but it really was a short-term thing until the permanent camps could be built. Well, um, we were given, after six months, we were um, taken to another place. And we were again in this camp. Everybody was scattered to different places. Our group was scattered to Topaz in Utah. And this was called a relocation center. And I think it's important to point out that our government made a tremendous effort to use phrases to cover reality. So they called these relocation center, evacuation, which didn't sound bad. It sounded like maybe there was a storm or something and they had to put us away somewhere, but just for, um, you know, a short time. Uh, they even called us, Nisei, non-aliens. They didn't want to say we were citizens, so they covered things over with their phrasing. 
with such a use of language. Um, in Topaz, um, I think that was where I got this real feeling of, my God, this is terrible, because it was so um, bleak and um, so isolated. Uh, let me read uh, one of the, I do a lot of oral history, and let me read what Kiyosato of Sacramento said. She says, and uh, again, we faced in the desert heat and cold. And, you know, we're from San Francisco. We didn't have the clothing. We didn't know uh, really what the extremes of weather could be like. Um, and Keo says, how could you sleep on a mattress of straw at 130 degrees? So we threw it all out and watered our cots. Everyone would line up their cots at the water faucet, sleepy-eyed. It was a funny feeling. We would look up and the sky was so beautiful at night and the coyotes and foxes are howling. Such a lonely feeling, wondering if anyone cared. There we were, abandoned, forgotten, thrown away. It was an awful feeling. And I think she brings in just kind of the feelings that we had as we entered into Topaz and all. Well, Topaz, I was I did, um, I was a block social worker. I worked with social workers uh, in the camps, and we had an opportunity to really talk with and be with the, the people, many of whom were experiencing problems. Um, after all, when you get into a strange situation, there were four or five people in our family, six people crowded in one room. Uh, when you had no privacy, when um, there was very little uh, to occupy your mind, when uh, conditions were so primitive that it was very difficult for people to um, uh, get along in many respects. So we had, and then you talk about um, teenage problems, you know, we had that too. And so um, as a social worker, I really came in contact with some of the real uh, hurt that had happened to uh, Japanese Americans being put into the camp. Um, but again, I want to point out the resiliency of the Japanese American people. And I'd like to point out one of the things that my brother told me about in terms of his trombone that he just cherished and brought all over with him. When we were in camp in Topaz, uh, they developed a good dance band. And they had parties and they put uh, dances on. About uh, 10 or 15 miles away, there was a uh, Delta High School. There was a school in Delta. And if you know Utah, the people are very conservative and all. And this was a high school, very conservative high school. But they heard about the dance band, and they didn't have a dance band of their own. So my brother said he got, a chance, got chances to go out from the camps to play at the U Delta High School um, uh, dances with the white kids and he said it was really interesting so he said to my mother see it was a good idea bringing that trombone <laughs> and uh, um, again the big problem that we ran into when we were in the camp in Topaz was that the WRA the War Relocation Authority uh, developed a new set of um, directives, one of which was to try to get as many Japanese Americans out of the camp at that point. At one time they thought of permanency, now they're talking about maybe getting us to go out. And what happened, of course, was that they set up a questionnaire, and a loyalty questionnaire, and a questionnaire that combined two questions that were so difficult for the people in the camps to answer. And there was a loyalty oath in which they asked people to forswear allegiance to the Emperor of Japan. And those of us who were in Nisei said, we never had any allegiance to the Emperor of Japan. We consider ourselves Americans. Why would we answer a question like that? And the Issei, the old people, who could not become citizens because of American laws, um, uh, bolt because it meant that they would, if they signed that they would uh, forswear allegiance to the emperor, they would be people without a country. And so, um, after much agitation, they did change the the question to just ask for loyalty to the United States. At the same time, they asked for people to volunteer for the American army. And again, the question was, would you volunteer for the American army when they put you into the camps and your families are still in camp to fight for the four freedoms that Franklin D. Roosevelt talked about as war aims? I mean, you know, it was such a 
a peculiar situation. Again, a lot of discussion and a lot of, um, uh, you know, sadness in the camp, uh, confusion and all. But finally, after a while, it settled down and most of the people um, answered yes to the loyalty and answered yes to the army question. And many of our young men went out to fight. And I'd like to talk about the 442nd. This was a volunteer army and this was an army of Japanese Americans, a segregated unit. And they got together with uh, another group that was from Hawaii and they became the most decorated, highly decorated unit of any uh, group of their size and their length of service in the whole history of the United States Army. They were so valiant and, you know, they paid with their lives for their, val for, uh, their service to the United States. Um, they were very much responsible for the fact that we were able to get redress uh, 46 years later. Um, and then there were people who, who were also in the military intelligence service and they had to fight in the Pacific and they ran into other problems because they looked like the enemy and yet there was one attached to every single combat unit in the Pacific. Over 33,000 Japanese Americans served in World War II and 6,000 of them in the Pacific theater of war. There was also camp resistance and I wish that there was some time that I could talk about what happened to people who resisted uh, going, first of all, there were people who resisted going into the camps, three men especially, their names stand out, and their cases went up to the Supreme Court and they were jailed. Um, the, in uh, uh, places like Wyoming, there were place, people who banded together and refused to serve unless the, uh, American, uh, the American government uh, freed their parents and freed people in the, from the camps. Well, it was in Topaz that I became an activist because I began to uh, see the problems that we were having. And that was where I met my husband, Ernie, who's here. And um, he was part of a group of young demos who were a left-wing group from, of course, San Francisco. And they were there and they, uh, we had, uh, they had all kinds of uh, uh, meetings at their home, etc. And it was the first time I was able to place what happened to us within the context of the world situation to see what happened to the Germans, uh, to the um, uh, Jewish people in Germany, to see what happened to the Chinese people as the Japanese conquered them, to see uh, the uh, flaws in our American uh, society with the treatment of the black people and the Indians and all. And so that was when I really changed from being kind of a, a nice Japanese uh, uh, graduate of a university to an, an activist and challenging everybody, every place. And uh, um, I uh, left camp bec um, because uh, I, was a I got out on a student leave and then a permanent leave. And all. I was planning to go to the University of Chicago, but we got married, I had children, I went eventually to University of Chicago and graduated and got my master's degree. Um, but uh, a lot of things happened in New York. One of the things that happened when we left camp, I'm taking too long, okay, sorry. Well, well let me just finish getting out of camp. <laughs> but uh, one of the things that happened getting out of camp was the fact that um, we, were called, we were called in by the administrator and they said to us, now remember, you're." about the first people going out of camp. Um, don't speak Japanese wherever you are. Don't gather in gr more than you know, groups of three. And don't call any attention to yourself because um, you're going to set back the reloc relocation program. Well, that was a very difficult charge for us because, um, you know, uh, and we tried to follow it. But let me add, it didn't take me long to get out of that. But it was interesting because we went to New York City and, you know, I said, my God, I could wear a Japanese kimono and carry a red flag and walk down Fifth Avenue and nobody would pay any attention to me because life back east was so different from California. But we did, and I participated in um, many things in, in uh, Chicago, and I'm not going to talk about that, but New York and Chicago. Um, I was, uh, I picketed with the NAACP and uh, with the Urban League. I participated in sit-downs. I have participated in the International League for Peace and Freedom, in um, uh, petition campaigns for, the, for stopping the nuclear, uh, for stopping nuclear development, uh, et cetera. But we did come back to California and, um, again, very active in California. Um, 
working with the school district and today. Um, I'm going to leave the story of redress out, but that's a very important story for us because what happened with redress was that the whole story of the Japanese Americans really was looked into by the Congress and we were given an apology and a signed uh, apology by George Bush and, <laughs> and a uh, uh, $20,000 20, for um, those of us who were in the camps and who are still alive. And it's interesting to note that that provision was put in those of us who are still alive was put in by Jesse Helms because he didn't want it to, con to go into the problems of other minorities and he was especially worried about the black, um, the Afro-American community. And so, you know, it's interesting that the, um, our, our bill was really limited in certain ways. But let me t um, just finish with saying that, um, you know, we felt um, we learned a lot. I think, as Janice said, we learned an awful lot from it. We learned that uh, we had to have our own Japanese scholars. We had to have Japanese American scholars who could interpret history in, from our viewpoint. We also learned that we had to work with other groups, that we can't do anything alone, that uh, redress campaign, we, we worked so hard with other groups. And we got, uh, again, a lot of people to help us. Uh, we also learned that we have to fight. We have to fight for justice for everybody not just for the Japanese Americans. Thank you. I want to name off the Bill of Rights that uh, those uh, parts of the Bill of Rights that were, uh, if I can find it, Bill of Rights violations, the right to be informed of charges, right to speedy and public trial, right to jury trial and confront accusers, right to call favorable witnesses, right for legal counsel, reasonable bail, and protection from cruel and unusual punishment and involuntary servitude. Then I'll read this poem that I wrote some time ago where the whole family had gone to sleep, and I was awake in the dining room and, and weeping a lot of tears. I've got to change my glasses now. This is called To Be or Not To Be. There's no such option. <laughs> Sometime in the past, when an ancestor of mine saw the morning glory twining round the well rope, she borrowed water from a neighbor that day. Sometime in the past, temple bells at dusk coincided with a flight of herons, and an ancestor of mine captured that moment in haiku, sumi ink on rice paper, lacy tracks like water beetles. Sometime in the past, with dirt-cracked fingers, my mother wrote her name over and over again on the alien brown soil where strawberries grow, straightened her back and wiped her sun-browned face. Those plowed acres yielded wedge shells of royal purple, rose, and pink shades unbleached by time, fossil treasures from an era when the surf lapped at the place that now is Garden Grove. Sometime in the past, in the third year of drought and crop failures, my father, 26, came to the golden land where nuggets dropped from trees. The year was 1901. He never saw his home again. 
His sweat soaked the ties of railroad lines from California to Colorado. Stranger to lightheartedness, he seeded and irrigated, fertilized, weeded, and harvested vegetables from Ventura to Costa Mesa. Sometime in the past, when my mother took me to Japan, I was six. I sang, My Country Tis of Thee, to German tourists at a shrine in Tokyo, for I believed then that all Caucasians were Americans. I was hurt when they turned their granite backs. I was hungry for the sound of English words. Sometime in the past, forbidden by law to become citizens, forbidden by law to own land, my parents piled their hopes for the future on their native-born offspring, me. Sometime in my past, I chose America, but America rejected me, banished from view my faux-tinged face. At gunpoint, I and those I resembled went to concentrate. We took of our belongings only what we could carry into ten sentry-guarded camps. A hundred and ten thousand of us were encircled by barbed wire and were concentrated. Searchlights raked our dignity. Sometime in my past, Home was a 25 by 25 foot unpartitioned space for me, my parents, and a stranger bachelor, minimum four bodies to a cubicle. Straw stuffed pallets are beds, meals in the mess hall, and a communal wash house we shared with 200 others in our block. More than three years I gave to my nation's war effort as voluntary exile, a choice I created when in truth I had none. Sometime in my past, I met the stares of the Mojave Indians on whose barren reservation our concentration camp stood, built by Del Webb, who died a multimillionaire. I stared back and at the miserable shacks my Native American brothers lived in. Three decades later, they live there still. Now it's four and five decades later. Sometime in my past, in the melting Arizona heat, fogged by talcum powder dust that stiffened my hair, lodged in my nose, and made my ho voice grow hoarse, my parents taunted me for taking the side of the country of my birth while it kept me and them in prison. They said real Americans are not locked up. They called me foolish. I cried. How bright the constellations in the crystal desert night. Sometime in my past, my brothers, volunteers from Hawaii, in the 100th Battalion, joined with my brothers from the concentration camps in the all-Japanese-American 442nd Combat Unit at Anzio, at Arno, and in the Vosges Mountains. Like demented warriors, they screamed, go for broke, and assaulted the enemy. The bodies of my brothers of the 442nd the most decorated, the most decimated unit in our nation's history, our stepping stones to freedom. Their unprecedented courage that earned them shining medals, shattered bones, and gaping wounds that bled and killed them, unlocked the minds of our captors, unlocked the gates of the concentration camps that held it held us, silenced those who would question our loyalty, 
And in those brutal battles, too many of my brothers were silenced forever. Who remembers their names engraved in bronze on memorial tablets where sparrows perch? I remember their deeds and I salute them. And I remember the passionate rage that burned inside us all. To my surprise, it flickers and flames anew when I ask, did my brothers have to die to gain for us the liberty already guaranteed us by the Bill of Rights? What manner of men were our American leaders? I will tell you, they were dwarfs, dwarfed by the size of my brother's sacrifice. Yes, I remember their deeds. Sometime in the past, the Supreme Court held that our longer incarceration without specific charges of wrongdoing and a speedy trial would besmirch the red, white, and blueness of America's Constitution. We scattered like gale-born thistledown, but not back to the farm, for the Santa Ana wind had erased my mother's signature. Sometime in my past, a Berkeley taxi driver showed me two mason jars of teeth, gold inlaid teeth extracted with pliers from the heads of the vanquished at Okinawa and Iwo. He watched me closely and was disappointed when I suggested he make with them a mosaic to hang on his dining room wall. Sometime in my past, the country of my birth dropped atom bombs on the land of my parents' origin. I saw the mangled tricycle a child had left behind. I saw etched on marble steps the outline of a man who disintegrated, consumed by a fireball two million degrees hot. I saw the scummy pond where the wounded sought water and drowned under the bodies of the seared ones who lay and died atop them like sandbags on a levee. Sometime in my past, my gentle guide, a woman half my age, sang a lullaby to still my noisy sobs. Her singing haunts me now, and I hear my own anguished protest, but we Americans aren't all like that. I belong to a women's peace group. I work for world peace. My pledge of peace, flabby solace for the fragmented 250,000 whose, whose parts lie buried in one mass grave, and to those dying this week, this month, of radiation sickness, their children and their children's children, pariahs with mutant genes. Sometime in my past, I wondered why in Hiroshima I chose to take the blame, declared myself American, when a Japanese identity would have spared me guilt and shame. I wondered when and where that decision had been made. When I was six in Tokyo, when challenged by my parents in concentration camp, why did I select the guilty face? To be or not to be, there's no such option. One simply is, once I simply am. Sometime in my present, I review the richness of my history. I see my life unique. I wear as hard-won medals my social, my ethnic, my woman's consciousness. My parents' hopes for me that I marry, bear issue, and pay my bills on time, all realized. I marvel anew at my good fortune to have married a man who cares, a militant of substance in whose glory I long have basked, excuse for doing nothing myself. 
possessed of hind wisdom a mother has, whose child has fled the nest. I wish my daughter well. It's up to her to fly. Somewhere in my now, when past and future link, east and west converge, and when spring renews its promises, I think of lovers who wait so long beneath the cherry trees, their lap, laps are filled with petals. <laughs> That's a uh, story of how I declared myself American no matter what and kept getting rebuffed. Uh, when I went to Reno with my late husband, I have a current one now. <laughs> and uh, they wouldn't let us get married because I was the wrong race. You know? So it continued on, that sort of thing. And I wanted to tell you that when I was in college, I took a course in sewing. I've told this story to many people. and. Uh, my teacher said, you're flat-chested. Go buy some falsies so you can look more like an American. And I th didn't have the wit to say to her, what's wrong with me the way I am? So I went and got these things, and, and I sweated underneath them and got heat rash. And I was very uncomfortable. But while I was sewing, I discovered that they made very good pin cushions. <laughs> so one day I was sewing, and a man came to the door, and he was selling magazines. And so uh, he started his spiel, and then he stopped. And he fixed upon my chest, and he said, I'm sorry, and he walked away. <laughs> I tell you that because it's funny, but it's also an example of how we were told in so many ways that we didn't quite belong or we didn't quite measure up. I knew that in a hundred years I'd never look like Betty Grable, but... Uh, you know, I was stuck with my body, and somehow I've survived. Boy, uh, when you come to the, uh, at the end of the panel like this, you have to either be short or loud. <laughs> I um, think I'll try to be short. Um, when Joy Morimoto, dear Joy, sitting over there, contacted me about this gig here today, I was a bit dubious because I am not a poet like my friend Janice here who, by the way, is a pre the preeminent Japanese-American poet. And I think that she's being very modest. Um, well, anyway, I told her I'm not a poet. And uh, Joy said, no, 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 that's OK. We're putting together a panel with uh, some uh, activist yeah. Japanese-American women. And um, we want to hear who you are and how you came to be that way. And so I said, okay, I can do that. Um, so I'm going to do that and maybe flesh out some uh, things that Chizu had mentioned here. But first I want to tell you a funny story just to wake you up. Um, a minister was preaching to his congregation about the problem of judging other people and what they were. At one point he said, if anyone out there be perfect, let him now stand up. A man stood up. Well, are you perfect? 
asked the minister. No, sir, he replied. I'm standing in here for my wife's first husband, who apparently was. <laughs> Well, what we all know is uh, that I am not perfect, and um, but I will try to uh, to act like I have um, a message here. Uh, I am not perfect, and to which my husband over there standing in the doorway will certainly attest. But you know, I've grown into my 74-year-old self, feeling pretty good, feel, feeling whole and alive and uh, probably content, certainly more than I was when I was 24 or 34 or even 54. And I'd like to tell you some, somewhat of how I think that came to be. For me, it's been mostly about access. Access with a capital A, with maybe a little luck and a little talent thrown in. Access, of course, in this case, being that some doors sprang open for me to let me see possibilities um, and let me know that I could aspire to things to which I was capable. And it gave me the energy and the will to try to make that happen for uh, other people. Well, access implies that the society around you holds sway, that they, they hold the power to let you in or keep you out, that, that the society is the keeper of the keys. Now, I know that that's, that's uh, open to argument in today's society because we all feel a little bit like we are empowered. But there are those in the world, of course, who do not have power. And um, what's more, when you don't have power, you don't even realize that you have been deprived. And that happened to me until I was 40. Um, I know that uh, bec because I have lived it. Well. The other day I was reading something by uh, Oprah Winfrey, which was published in uh, the Chronicle last Sunday. She was talking about her role in the uh, upcoming film, Beloved, um, uh, the Toni Morrison novel. She talked about having uh, contemplated quitting her TV program because she was just tired of it. And then she said, I said to myself, how dare you be tired? You come from a people, a long line of people who have had no voice, no money, no power, no vision, no vehicle for themselves or their children. And you have been given this. I think that she was talking mostly about access and just a little bit about her considerable talent and luck. Well, I've just returned from a pilgrimage of sorts with my husband and my brother and his wife to a place where I was born and spent the best part of my childhood. This was in Colorado, where some years later um, I was to be interned in a wartime camp um, because our family had moved to California in 1937. We visited that camp, too, and uh, Chizu has amply described how uh, the Topaz camp was, and Colorado was not any different from that. They all seem to be have a kind of model. Well, so when we visited there, it had changed a bit. The um, buildings were all down, of course, <coughs> and um, my husband and I stood on a, the stone slabs that served as the foundation for our honeymoon house. And uh, memories of those years and the years I spent before then, when we indeed had no voice, no money, no power, no vision, and no vehicle for ourselves, just flooded over me. 
And then the contrast between the time that we visited there um, just a month ago and the warm welcome we had received in the town nearby contrast into the time that we had spent in um, the camp in the years before couldn't have been more absolute. The Japanese had been excluded from almost everything, as Chizu mentioned, except labor in the most menial jobs. From the day they landed in the United States, uh, they were barred from unions, prohibited from becoming naturalized citizens, barred from buying land, barred from certain housing, and of course, as young people, we were barred from restaurants, certain restaurants, and places of recreation. I think it's probably inconceivable to some of you young folk today to, to realize that we were your age and we couldn't go to, um, say, see Tommy Dorsey at a certain kind of um, a venue if we wanted to. So our imprisonment in camp, it seems to me, was simply a culmination of that exclusion from American life, the ultimate symbol of denial to access. I'd like to read a little uh, bit from my book. This is a commercial. Uh, has to do with um, what, ha what happened to one woman when um, Pearl Harbor uh, happened. Not surprisingly, when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, a firestorm of intense hostility towards the resident Japanese burst over the West Coast. Remember Pearl Harbor swiftly became a rallying cry, resonant with hate and an ugly mood uh, for reprisal. But in mocking irony, the Nisei were to have more reason than any other to remember Pearl Harbor. This is my friend Yonagata speaking. I had gone to a Nisei basketball game in Oakland when the attack was announced. I guess I didn't quite believe it, or I wasn't quite sure of its significance. Anyway, I went to a movie that afternoon with Mort. Mort was her husband. They kept interrupting it with announcements of the attack and calls for all Navy personnel to report to their ships. Then I began to feel frightened and guilty, as if I personally had something to do with it. Akin to Nagata's state of mind, feelings of guilt resided in the far reaches of many Nisei psyche knowing and debilitating. And you know, I think the residual of that still exists today. Almost unconsciously, they had long carried the weight of racial guilt, the guilt of being born to a race despised by their fellow citizens. The bombing by Japan served to heighten this curious sense of culpability. Well, you know, when you've been conditioned for a long while uh, to the fact that that you are a lesser person in this society. I think that it becomes part of you. It must be your fault somehow. That's, that's how I see racial guilt. Um, well, so access to me, getting back to my story, uh, came by little increments in my early life. Uh, a teacher who let me know that uh, I might have something in me, a neighbor woman who let me borrow books when I came to clean her house. But it wasn't until the 60s when the women's movement and the civil rights movement happened that I began to see possibilities for myself. Then I began to feel that being Japanese was okay, that being a woman was okay, and um, that the doors would not be entirely closed to me for those features. Um, let me read to you something that happened, that might have happened to um, other 
women. Rights for Women, the 1970s and 80s. One of the more significant effects of the civil rights movement of the 1960s was its affirmation of the validity and importance of different cultures. African American, Asian American, and Chicano studies, as well as other ethnic studies, proliferated the, in the colleges. Symbolic of this pride, African Americans donned dashikis, sported Afro hairstyles, and traveled to Africa for the first time. Japanese Americans began to study the Japanese language again, and even invited non-Japanese to their homes for a meal to be eaten with chopsticks. You know, before, before the war, whenever we had um, uh, Caucasian visitors, we would kind of try to hide the chopsticks. Um, it just kind of tells you our mindset. Not surprisingly, the revolution in civil rights also infused new vigor into the struggle for women's rights. Women's, women fought institutional sexism, demanded equal job opportunities with equal pay. Others struggled to liberalize abortion laws. If the women in the society at large had difficulty advancing their program of liberation, Nisei women found it doubly hard. Like their mothers, they had found a large measure of contentment in their roles of wife and mother. To a large extent, too, they had lived for and through their children. Their children's successes or failures became their own. But as Bob Dylan's ballad proclaimed, the times they are changing and the militant mood of women in the society resonated, resonated if faintly, in Nisei household. Nisei women were beginning to wonder if they weren't missing something. I know I began to wonder. When their children were gone, would it be enough for them to sit back and bask in their children's successes as their mothers had done? The answer, of course, at least for some women, was a re resounding no. Like Ibsen's Nora Helmer, they began to look at themselves in relation to society in a different light, an emerging realization that being a wife and mother were not enough. While those were sacred duties, they also had a duty to themselves. Well, after my own children were gone, I started college at age 46 right here at San Francisco State. And I finished up at Cal State Hayward with a degree, master's degree in English and literature. And that actually gave me the tools for a lot of things that I needed to do. Well, as it happened at the time, I was able to exercise my newfound muscles in working against the war in Vietnam, uh, helping to uh, organize a, a, an information center in Walnut Creek, and uh, demonstrating against the war. I would never have felt the power to do that before then. At the same time, I began to speak out about our imprisonment in World War II camps and gave what I believed to be the first on-the-air interview about that episode on a small local Concord, California station. Then uh, the big idea began to s sink in to me that no matter how much you have on the ball, if doors are closed to you, by the more powerful, you don't even begin to think that you have anything important uh, to do. And that was the force that lit my activity in human and civil rights and to speak out against exclusionary practices like anti-affirmative action and the anti-immigration laws, uh, things like that. But um, I must add that at the same time, I am more aware today than ever of the debt of gratitude that I owe to those valiant people who have struggled to open the doors through the years um, from the beginning and the civil rights workers, African Americans who laid down their lives and led the struggle, the women who defied 
ridicule and abasement, they helped me to validate me and help me to be okay with who I am. So, in answer to your question, Joy, in a nutshell, this is who I am and this is how I got here. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we're going to open this up for you to um, respond and to answer some, ask some questions of these three preeminent, thank you, man, <laughs> women. Um, I must say, though, I must say very quickly that I was on, um, on a panel this morning about African Americans and, and the legacy of slavery. I don't know why I was there, but um, I was there uh, on KQED, and um, truly, not to make comparisons because I don't think we can make comparisons about slavery or about the Holocaust, but I think there are parallels in our lives. And, you know, truly, anytime one is dominated or feeling less than or is uh, told that one is, um, you know, should be excluded or does, is uh, not, is dehumanized by any system, um, that there is that parallel. There is the internalization, there is the legacy of that. And I think that the camps you know, was the defining, the camps were the defining moments in our, his, in my history, my family's history, I believe, in our race's history. And in some ways, um, it will perpetually and always be the reference point for me, and I believe for many of us, because that is the point from which we learn, and that is the point from which we understand that we cannot stand for any injustice toward anybody. Um, and, and think that we are immune from that. I, I, I think that even that stereotype about us being the model minority is a form of slavery and that for us to think that we can give in to that or think that we are more acceptable because we are lighter or lesser, I mean, or less, um, um, less uh, uh, obvious in our uh, exclusion or less poor or less any of those um, areas related to classism or racism or sexism or uh, homophobia that any of the, it is a deception and it is a way in which the institution of slavery which is alive and well today in the form of racism and um, Proposition 209 and biling, you know, exclusion of bilingual education and all of the struggles that we're all many of us are involved in that 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 is uh, again the institutionalization of slavery where pe one group of people because of their color or their race or their gender or their sexual orientation is excluded and discriminated against. So truly, the, you know, this is, uh, I, I value sessions like this, I value your stories because they certainly do spur us and inspire us to continue our struggles. And I'll be quiet and let you talk now. <laughs> so why don't we hear it from you and, and ask if you have any questions of these incredible women um, who have ta taught me and uh, and many of the women I work with um, about the value and the beauty of breaking the silences and affirming our community. Yes? Um, the, uh, I understand well, the uh, official motivation for the camps was um, fear of um, sabotage and whatnot. Uh, but uh, I've also um, heard um, or been reading uh, other motivation, uh, economic motivation, or um, <coughs> were taken from because uh, they own a lot of land uh, or uh, farmed a lot, a lot of land in California. Um, the camp store was uh, motivation uh, to move out, so um, uh, white farms can move in and take the uh, take the land. So can I have like some clarification? Anybody? She's in. When the, when the committee that looked into the reasons of, um, you know, for the uh, treatment of Japanese Americans during World War II, they came up with the conclusion that it was not military necessity, but it was um, uh, uh, racial discrimination, um, war hysteria, and lack of political leadership. It did not put in economics, but I think economics had a great deal to do with it. By 1940, the Japanese uh, farmers, uh, in the, people in the agricultural field, had uh, uh, taken over a good many of the crops that were um, like strawberries, um, uh, asparagus, uh, you know, things like that, the quick 
crop, uh, crops that you could grow quickly. And um, they were, um, I think, something like 70% or something of um, the uh, people who grew them. And they also had a large network of um, uh, getting them to the market and of selling them so that we were really very much into the agricultural produce uh, uh, situation. And that was one of the big reasons why places like the American, I think there were, um, I forget the names of them, but there were some farmers groups, um, white farmers groups that were very, very hysterical about the Japanese. I think they pointed out that we were living near, uh, we had farms and all, living near adjacent airports and things of that kind. We were very spurious ar arguments. Um, and all. So economics did have a lot to say. I think economics also came into play when we had to sell our things. And people I know who had farms who sold them for a pittance. Um, I know that um, my sister talked about having to sell all her stuff and she was so unhappy because she had been, uh, she had just married about a couple of years before that and had all these new things and people were coming in and buying them for again ten, fifteen dollars or whatever. So there was a very strong economic factor. The Japanese Americans lost a lot of money and a lot of property. So the twenty thousand dollars that was given to us was just a pittance of what had happened. And for three and a half years of being in camp, I mean, you know, being in prison, it uh, does not cover at all. about re-entering life after internment was over. I mean, just throw that out. I mean, did you just go, I mean, did you, anyway, I mean, just to, I don't know, unless you might difficult, it's difficult. Did you go back and re-enter life after internment was over? Well, I think that's a good question. I think that the internment was really just a way of getting access to the world. I mean, that's what people think of it. I mean, like, you know, you have to get out of here. Coming back from camp was difficult for a lot of people. There was, of course, a lack of housing. And uh, in some areas, uh, people were not welcoming uh, the returnees. And, and in fact, there, were, there was a lot of uh, agitation for keeping Japanese out of California. But uh, gradually, um, you're right, we, um, the, the job market started opening up. Um, a woman who was uh, trained to be a teacher, could never find a job. And in 1949, I think she became the first Japanese-American teacher. So, so that things were gradually uh, happening. My husband and I tried to buy a house in 1954, and there was still a um, racist codicil on there that said that uh, this house should not be sold to anyone other than white. Uh, and there were many instances like that until that housing rule came into play. But I, I think that, that um, the thing that you mentioned about access, that people began to feel better and feel that maybe they didn't have to uh, stay in their little um, ghettos or their little blocks, that they could, they now felt more free to go out into the public. And they were having children too, and that was important that um, they provide a place for their children and not have to um, stay in those, those little places where we, were forced to stay. Um, that answered your question. I'd like to say something on that because um, it was a very difficult time coming out from the camps. And at the time of 1945, when Topaz closed, uh, over half the people were still in camp. And the half of the people who were still in camp were the old people and the children. And the men had gone out or, and all. But we also had, uh, again, people who were frightened about what was going to happen to them on the outside. And there were real reasons for it. Uh, we have a friend, for example, who was in uh, the 442nd. And when he was still fighting in the 442nd, 1945, the beginning of 1945, we were allowed to go back to California. Let me add, it was because of a suit that was filed by Mitsue Endo, a Japanese American woman, in which uh, the Supreme Court said that they could not keep us into the camps. But um, 
when he was fighting out there, his farm was being burned down. His people were being attacked. And there were many instances of actual physical violence against the Japanese Americans so that people were afraid to go back, especially in the rural areas where they had the farming uh, interests and all. So there was problems, and there were problems. And I think when May said problems of buying housing, we, we also, for a whole year, my husband and I looked all over. We were living in Chicago, could never find a house uh, in the suburbs or whatever. So that, again, you know, we, we really had those problems. I would like to point out that uh, employment became much more open. But one of the reasons is because the United States was the only intact Western power and therefore the economic, uh, you know, we had jobs because we had to help build up the rest of the world. And so we went into a period of real prosperity. And it was as a result of that as well as the fact that there were people who felt you got to do something about the four, the four freedoms that were promised to us by the president. And so there was a tide. And so the Japanese Americans um, in 1952, for example, 53, um, we were able to get citizenship for our parents. And I could remember my mother studying English and studying, you know, um, asking questions about the Constitution so she could pass the tests and things. So that the access did become much wider, but it was also there are many factors to it, and I guess pr uh, primarily, I think, uh, like we worked on an Emmett Till campaign in Chicago where a young uh, black man was uh, lynched by people, who, uh, you know, because he happened to look, quote, at a white woman in a particular fashion and all. So all of us, some of us got really very much into the larger issues which included the opening of, of uh, access to Afro-Americans as well as ourselves. Uh, I wanted to tell you about an incident that occurred to me when I had uh, moved to Berkeley and uh, joined uh, the Berkeley Interracial Committee, the members of whom were active in getting signatures on a petition so that we could vote against the restrictive covenant in California. and. All my friends had their little clipboards and were getting all kinds of signatures. So I decided I'd do that. And I, the first door I went to, this woman said, well, if the house next door was for sale and you could afford it, uh, would you buy it and move in? And I said, well, that's the whole point of this. And she said, weren't you in one of those camps? And I said, yes. And she said, I don't want to live next door to an ex-con. No. So that was the end of my petition gathering. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and um, later on, when President Governor Carter was running for election, he came to speak to the Filipino-American, Chinese-American, Japanese-American Democratic clubs. We were still segregated in, in that respect. And uh, so he spoke and told us, uh, you know, that he understood our problems because he had been in the Navy and had been to our countries. He'd been to the Philippines, he'd been to China, and he'd been to Japan. And uh, we were told by uh, Norman Mineta, the uh, chairman, that we shouldn't ask questions, so I was steaming. <laughs> so being a good soldier, I didn't say anything. But I wrote him a letter. And I said, no wonder we were stuck in concentration yeah. camp for three and a half years because there were ignoramuses like you <laughs> in, in government. And, and I sent it to him in a uh, United Airlines vomit bag. So, <laughs> this, 
As a matter of fact, I have a supply of vomit bags that, <laughs> that I send, you know, Bevy. Oh, hi. Hi, did he answer you? Uh, no, but I got an invitation to the inaugural. <laughs> So that was an answer. I guess uh, people, uh, you know, in middle management on those campaigns sort of select grassroots people, and I was one of those. Select is a good word. I was wondering, uh, racism and the effects of racism seem to be really prevalent, um, especially during uh, war times, uh, like World War II and the Vietnam War. Gulf War recently, and I was wondering what are some effective ways to prevent that you've seen prevent uh, misguided nationalism from from contributing to racism. Mm. Well, I want to tell you about your uh, beloved president of San Francisco State, uh, Senator Hayakawa, during the. Um, when was that? The Iran-Contra thing. He uh, suggested that we refurbish the concentration camps for uh, uh, putting in the, uh, what, the Iranians. And uh, so I wrote him a letter on a vomit bag <laughs> and said, you make me puke, but... Uh, <laughs> No, there. Uh, I mean, there. There's racism. There's nationalism. There's all kinds of things interwoven into this rather marshy area where we walk. Did you want to respond to that, man? You look like you're eager to. No. To the, the question. Yes. No. Fine. <laughs> She's there. Yeah. I'd like to say something on that. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that you know we have learned is that we need to take action as soon as those things happen. And what we have done, for example, when the Arab, uh, when the Gulf War came out, we immediately contacted. And I'm saying by we, I mean our Japanese American organizations. I'm with the JACL and uh, with uh, you know the National Japanese American Historic Society. We immediately contacted the Arab American organizations. Said, how can we help? We had a press conference. I know that JCL had a press conference in which they pointed out the dangers of that kind of, you know, uh, irrational um, statements against Arab Americans or you know, any other group. And I think when the Palestinians, for example, five Palestinians were arrested or something. And again, we, um, I think, um, Japanese Americans. Uh, hopefully have learned the lesson from the camps so that we learn how to go immediately after, uh, you know, uh, and all. Before that, we do a lot of education before. You've got to educate people before. And we work with the schools. I've uh, written school uh, uh, guidance things on peace and, and uh, on uh, the uh, civil rights and things of that kind. And we go to the, to the schools and speak to the children and uh, speak to I've even had, you know, K to three in Berkeley, and I'm thinking, how do I get this, you know, uh, thing about civil rights across to them, and all. But it was been very interesting because the kids really pick up, you know, what you're talking about, and about Americans being of different, uh, you know, different uh, uh, races and different colors and things of that kind. Children pick those things up, and the children are very good about it. We go back every year. And I go back to Jefferson School every year. And the children, same children, you know, are a grade um, higher. And they're so happy to see us. And they say, we know why you're here, you know. And, you know, it's uh, Executive Order 9066. I mean, they know about that, you know, and that, and that we must never let this happen again to anybody else. So I think that you have to do both the education beforehand, of talking to groups beforehand, and then when crises happen, then to do something immediately. And I think that you need to, we had a, a, a big meeting. Uh, I think I was with the NCRR. We had a big meeting with Ar Arab Americans, and they told us what was happening to them. And we went out again with letter writing campaigns and things of that kind. You've got to do political action as well. I think that we're particularly blessed in the Bay Area 
that we have an incredible diversity and that we celebrate that diversity and we're really acknowledging one another in that diversity, although certainly we have a lot of work to do here too. But I think about the young man who was murdered in Wyoming and I think about the hate crimes that happen in the hate and I think about, you know, the struggles that all races at one time or another, the, you know, the inter, inter, inter community fighting that happens among the poor. And I think that it is our responsibility, every single one of us, to address those issues as they come up and, and to promote the dialogue with one another, and particularly on the campuses, I think, that because you have, you know, you have the platform, you have the, the, um, the community built in here where that dialogue can occur. I mean, I know at Glide that it is really, really important, that commitment to diversity, the commitment to address the wrongs whenever they arise, and we address them immediately, and we try to be as honest as possible about how we're connected. I mean, I get called on all the time, and you know, things slip. I mean, I made a heterosexist remark to somebody about Oprah Winfrey coming to Glide, and you know, something about bringing out the real man in somebody. And I got so confronted, I mean, three gay guys came at me and said, how did you say that? So, I mean, I, and I get confronted, and it was a slip. I mean, it was not an intentional thing. It was not intended to, but I mean, I have to look at myself all the time, and that community will make you look at yourself all the time. It certainly does make me more aware, and it certainly does make me question my humanity, and I think that that's what we're, that was incumbent upon us to do is to, is to make sure that we're constantly aware of who we are with each other in our humanity. Because we can't rest on that. You know, we can't take it for granted that liberal San Francisco, that racism, you know, doesn't exist. Or, you know, that we've got the homophobic situation all together. I mean, we do not. And we have, you know, we, Fred, Fred Phelps was here, what, five years ago? And Randy Schultz was, uh, when Randy Schultz died and confronted us at the church. And, he was right on the news this two day, or yesterday, in fact, talking about um, how shameful it was that the young man uh, would. Uh, well, he, they were protesting at the Matthews uh, in Wyoming's funeral um, against homosexuality and creating that terrible pain for their family. I mean, again, we have a great, great distance to go. So, other questions? I'm sorry. I'll start preaching. <laughs> I was wondering, Janice, if any of you could speak about the connection uh, that was made between your experience and then later your poetry and your expressiveness in the artistic area, and when that happened. Do you, you know, did, how much does it inform your art? Would you have been a poet otherwise? Um, I think that poetry, personally for me, saves my life because my legacy has been about the isolation as a, an abused child uh, in my childhood, but also the legacy of silence about the camps and the sense of what you call the lesser humanity um, in terms of my race. And so that internalization of that self-hate, I think, would have been very, very, very much more destructive for me had I not had the poetry to begin to break the silences and to, break, to begin to break that isolation for me. So the poetry was informed by the history. Um, the poetry was informed by the injustice. The poetry is informed by the racism. Um, and I think that it, it for me, is, is the healthy way to, um, to reach out and to attempt to communicate whatever pain or joy or triumph or uh, pride that I have. Certainly, I, I will say about these three women that their stories today um, is, is a perfect illustration of how important it is for to hear these stories, to, re, to revisit history, to redefine history, and to continue to define ourselves as who we authentically are, and not allow the systems and the institutions to continue to define us. My history was one of invisibility. The poetry was that vehicle that helped me to define my visibility. So I think that that's your question, is that right? Do, would you, any response to the three of you? Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yes. I was wondering, with regards to a lot of the, the social and racial problems that are going on, how do we, how do we make aware fights that are going on in, say, Indonesia and also the former Soviet states in which the same things that happened to Jew 
Polish Americans, Japanese Americans are happening again. And although they're getting played media, it, it's as if that although Americans know how much is being done, they kind of get swept beneath the carpet. And how do we how do we raise that awareness among ourselves as Americans and also people abroad? You know, what kind of medium can we use to make that aware? It's <laughs> a lot. That's a big question. <laughs> you know, it, it just surprised me that. Uh, During the time it happened, there was some play in the media and news, and after that, nothing else had come yeah. on about it. Yeah. But, you know, it makes me wonder as well, like, how much do we, do we really get from, you know, the media we watch on news? Are, yeah. Are we taking that, um, are we taking that everything we hear and see as is, is it truly is? You know, what other crosses are being covered up? You know, Absolutely. what other things are going on? You know, <laughs> I think we, we, we say that, well, there's a saying that history repeats itself. And it's true, it does happen, but it, it seems as though no matter how many times it does happen in whichever country it does occur in, nobody really gets the message. It yeah. continues. And people are more yeah. preoccupied with hiding a lot of the injustices that go on. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think the point you make is such an important one. I was listening to KPFA today while I was cleaning the house. And, um, you know, again, the point they make, which is the media is really controlled. We have a very controlled media. And it's getting worse. It's not getting better in that you're getting um, uh, different uh, large uh, groups uh, combining and so you're getting less and less of the variety and people who speak out um, I heard Jim Hightower and you know people like that are um, their airwaves are taken away from them I mean they're no longer hired in certain places and so I think that it is something for us to be really concerned about the media all you have to do is look at our media the last I don't know how many when Monica Lewinsky was the only thing that they talked about when that was the only thing when there were so many other important things that were going on. Um, my feeling is that you support um, uh, any group that is trying to uh, get the news out and um, you know I was just uh, reading this thing by this woman April who um, had uh, uh, charge that uh, certain kind of gas was being used against uh, people in Vietnam and her story was immediately attacked and and she keeps insisting that she has all the names of people etc but there's no way for her to get out to that and I think that it is you know a real problem uh, my you know the other thing is that you support we're lucky we have uh, you know some radio stations that do uh, 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 listen to what people have to say and who do what we call investigating reporting and I think that that's really slowing down in our country and so um, yeah, I'm rather I don't have a really good answer except to support wherever you can any group that's coming out um, with uh, what we call uh, and I think public radio probably is the about the only place that you're finding it but you know you look at Ted Cobb we were at the Beijing I was at the Beijing Women's Conference and I heard uh, this woman Laura I forget her last name who spoke about um, what was going on in the world in terms of the lack of information that comes out to people and it's places like that that you learn about so many things that are going on all over the world and you know we found I mean when I came back I got inspired to write some you know uh, articles and speak to people about what had happened but I think we need to have more of that and all but I really don't have an answer and how do you how do you um, fight the media it's very difficult because we don't have the money and we don't have the power uh, and all. maybe access sometimes little access here and there but not uh, in the powerful places that we would like to see it yeah I, I just think that because we are so programmed to believe that we don't have the power individually to change something as powerful as the media uh, that we do get apathetic I mean we just get tired or we just we don't believe it and I and you know, the, this whole thing around Clinton and Monica Lewinsky, I know everybody is sick of it. Um, and <coughs> not to make a judgment one way or another about that, but I do believe that the American people have said, I'm tired of this, we are tired of this. And the media does listen if enough people say, we don't want to see that, or we, you know, this is something that is turning our stomach. Or <laughs> you know, we like to get on with the business of the country, or we want to get on with much more important issues here. Um, I, I think that enough individuals do that. I mean. 
we all know this because I'm sure all of you in this room are activists that it, it doesn't you know you can't stop with that oh my gosh what's the use you have to even if you're the only voice you have to write to your congressperson or you have to make that protest you have to make that phone call or write that letter I mean I, I really think that that's that's something we can't give up on and I don't I don't know how else to say that because it is a very difficult issue and we do you know we have seen the power of the media and how it can certainly twist um, history in a way that uh, that is very destructive but it is our responsibility. It is our responsibility. It is 6.20, and maybe we can take one more question, and if, if that's all right with you ladies. Because um, we could probably talk all night. <laughs> <laughs> one more question. Well, I, I really want to express on behalf of all of us. Thank you, Janice and uh, May and Noriko and Shizu. There are books for sale right outside from the bookstore, so please uh, go and check out our author's work. And um, I also just wanted to thank uh, all of our readers today one more time, especially in light of that last question, because um, today we were able to have historical witnesses. And Noam Chomsky talks about intellectual responsibility and that if you know you're responsible. So I think today was an opportunity, and I think the information that we gathered here today can have a great exponential effect if we take it outside this room with us now. So thanks very much.